Hello everyone, I'm Nini FC and this is Blue Line CV. And today I'm bringing you guys a completely different video. I'm going to be bringing you guys a tactical breakdown and analysis of our 3 0 defeat to Bournemouth last night. Now, I've been meaning to try and do videos like this for a long time now. And the main reason is, is because a lot of times when I see things in the game, it's very hard for me to describe what I'm seeing and for you guys to really understand what I'm coming across. So I'm hoping in these styles of videos that they do become quite popular. And I'm hoping that people really understand and see the perspective from which I'm seeing things. And before I start the video, just a quick reminder, if you haven't pressed the bell notification button, please press that and stay notified to all things Blue Line CV. And if you guys like the video, smash that like button. Let me get 500 likes for this video. But anyway, getting straight into the tactical breakdown of our 3-0 defeat to Bournemouth. Now, as I stated in my match review, this win was a long time coming for Bournemouth. We've had so many difficult games against them. The game recently in the Carabao Cup quarter final, in that second half, Bournemouth were all over us. And it's clear that a win was going to come for them eventually because they know how to play against us. And the first thing that Eddie Howe got his team to do was match the system. Bournemouth did line up with a 3-4-3 system. And we've really struggled against teams that have matched us with three at the back systems. Now, as I always say in every single video, we're very susceptible to being pressed in our own half. And what teams look to do is obviously stop the wing backs from getting forwards. They look to possession themselves in closing up the passing lanes. So normally that's the space in between of the centre backs and the wing backs are for example. And they do this because they want Chelsea to force the long direct ball. Because then what they do is, is they have their back three situated pretty close to each other. So then close out and outman our attacking players. This image on the screen perfectly illustrates that. As we can see, someone's press height alongside Zappa Costa and Kante has no passing options. Now, of course, if Bakayoko was a better player, it's going to sound harsh, but that's the reality. He'd be dropping in a bit deeper to become a passing outlet. And really, that's what you get with Cesc Fabregas. Now, later on in this video, I'm going to let you know exactly what Cesc offers and he's deep in those areas receiving the ball. He helps us play out when we're getting pressed in our own half. And as I keep stressing, for me, he should start every single game. In this scenario, the ball is played back to Courtois. And this is another thing that teams like to do. They don't want Chelsea playing out from the back. They want them to force the long ball. And as we can see, Courtois clears it to no one because his kicking isn't as great in terms of finding someone from distance. And the ball goes out of possession. This is another thing too. People constantly hover around Eden Hazard. Whenever he's on the ball, you see one of the defenders will press him and harry him to move into positions that aren't as dangerous and to move him away from goal. Another situation where we're struggling to play out from the back and it's forced long by Courtois. And this makes no sense. And again, easy possession lost. And it just gets me thinking Conte should know by now what the struggles are with the team. Sesk was important for this game because he becomes the outlet because he's able to drop deep and because he actually reads the game very well, he can beat an opposition press and he can play that decisive pass. He's key in helping us transition from playing out from the back and keeping the ball in the opposition half. I mean, there's so many clips I have of Courtois forcing it long. Now we try to play it out from this area here. And again, force directs. And of course, we're back in our own half again. As we can see here, Bournemouth kept a very compact press they stay very close to each other and they look to harry people in the wide areas. And this is what teams do all the time that really we struggle against. Yet Wilson continues to press to Harry Courtois to force him to try and play it long. And the amount of times we gave the ball away in our own half was criminal. This here is another example of applying pressure to the wing back, snuffing out the passing lanes and forcing them to really rush that forward pass. And as I was saying earlier, one of the Bournemouth defenders in the back three will actually break the defensive line to help push out to obviously apply the press one of our front three players. See, two players, one on Hazard, one on Barkley, and there's still backup behind them. And if you really look at the distances in which Bournemouth are pressing high as a team, the yards of space between the midfield defence and the attack weren't very much. I'm guessing probably 20 to 25 yards between them. Now, Marcus Alonso is criminal of constantly losing possession like this plays it in the blind areas. And this is exactly why Conte likes to target men because in a way they are like the cheat codes in this system because you can just pump it to them and they have the physical strength and aerial prowess to keep the ball. Is it a sophisticated way of playing? Of course not. If Conte is setting the team out to play like this, then it's our only option really. This clip here perfectly illustrates 
the compact pressing that Bournemouth had. I'm going to explain later why his team uses defensive structure against us. Now when Bournemouth were trying to play out from the back, they never once tried to play out with their defenders, very rarely did they do that. A lot of times they'd look to use the direct pass from Begovic out from the back and he'd target the area on the right hand side because obviously that's where Berik is airily. Aspi is decent in the air, not amazing. Zappa Costa isn't great in the air himself. And you actually see later on in the second half that this really helped them in actually scoring the first two goals. Again, another example of a compact defensive structure. Bournemouth aren't trying to get themselves stretched. They're trying to keep it tight in the middle. And the yards of space between defence, midfield and attack isn't far. As you can see here, Hazard, Pedro and Barkley are close to each other. It makes it very difficult because they're crowded out. And when your only outlets are guys behind you that aren't really doing anything in possession of the ball in the offensive areas, and then you've got your wing backs out very wide, it makes it very difficult. And that's all due to the rigged positioning that we use. Barkley's struggling here. Of course, he's going to struggle. He isn't used to the team just yet. And this is what Bournemouth were looking to do when they were forced to use counter-attacks. Now, they'd use the pace of a Jordan Ebi or Stanislas or Wilson to make runs in behind and run into the areas where the wing backs have left space in behind. You can see this clip here, a perfect example of this happening. And that was to stretch Chelsea out wide and put them in uncomfortable situations. Now here, things really took a turn for the worse when Christensen ran off with a muscular injury. It looked like he got a hamstring injury. And this argument's been made a lot of times. We know that Conte has a very, very strong training session where it requires a lot of physical work. And really, it's no surprise to me that we're getting so many players picking up hamstring injuries. Now, those types of injuries in particular come due to fatigue. This two month period, we've been playing a game nearly every three days. It's no surprise why these small injuries are coming up. Now, what we were trying to do was obviously get the ball to the front three. And by doing that, we need to give them possession of the ball between the lines where Bournemouth have their defense and their midfield, because that's where they cause a lot of damage. That's where they can stretch teams and obviously pull defenders out of position. As we see in this clip here, Pedro loses his marker, drops deep. And what this has done, that's made space free on the left-hand side for Marcus Alonso. As we can see here, Pedro plays a nice cross-field pass. Alonso unmarked, puts in a brilliant ball. And honestly, that miss was decisive because again, I make this point all the time, getting the first goal, especially when you play with managers like a Mourinho or Conte, is so incredibly vital because when you get the first goal, that changes the whole dynamics of the game. And then we'd have more luck in actually getting the ball to the front three in those lines between the midfield and defence. And that's when we can really cause them a lot of problems. As I said in my match preview, we've been beating Bournemouth a lot of times by playing those direct balls straight to those guys in those key areas. Yesterday, we weren't able to do that. And if Hazard had scored that goal, it would have been a completely different game. Still, with the introduction of Rudiger coming on for Christensen, we had a bit more joy playing out from the back. That's because Kale doesn't offer anything playing as a wide defender in terms of possession of the ball. He doesn't drive with it. He doesn't really look to call for it. And this is the main reason why teams actually target him when it comes to pressing. They either want him to have possession because he's going to lose it or they press him aggressively. But one thing we like to do to really beat that press is obviously switch the play quickly from the right hand side to the left and vice versa. In this clip here, we were able to do this exactly. Bakayoko plays that cross field pass to Rudiger. I mean to Alonso. Rudiger receives it. He's pushing that wide and plays a world-class cross-field pass to Zappi Costa. Now that was one of the few times where a defender has been able to push out from his line and really try and do something with possession. And in this clip, it's another example of Rudiger being comfortable on the ball, breaking his line to push up into midfield. And obviously that drags people out. And obviously that's gonna affect Bournemouth's defensive structure because that's gonna force one of their players to step out of position to try and close him down. As we can see here, a very good run by Rudiger, pushes all the way into the opposition half. And this is just poor by Alonso. I mean, I don't see how you're not reading that. And it's just typical of Marcus Alonso. Too many times moves do get broken down on the left-hand side. But really with that first half, that really summed up a lot of the problems and issues that we've been having recently over this past couple of months. Now, this is where I analyze and break down why we conceded. As I said, the goal kick comes from Begovic, who hits it out 
to the right hand side of the pitch. Now here, so frustrating, so annoying. Bakayoko does very, very poorly. Even looking at his body language, wasn't even ready to receive the ball then. Brush off way too easily and a poor first touch with his chest. And this has really put a lot of pressure on our defenders now because they weren't really in their set positions because they were dealing with an aerial ball. And this mistake's come out the blue. But of course, I'm gonna blame Conti on this because Gary Kale isn't a guy that should ever be playing in the middle of a back three. He knows that, that's why he's been using Christensen and Louise. I don't understand why he didn't want to push Aspie in there. Maybe he's thinking he likes that attacking threat that they offer, pushing out wide. But this really sums up all of Kale's limitations. He's a very limited defender in my opinion. He's good at dealing with aerial balls. That's about it. And also if you play with very defensive low blocks, Kale is very useful there. But when it comes to playing a high line, because positioning is always off, as we can see in this clip, yeah. He's getting sucked into the ball, ball watching. And if you guys realise, you never ever see Christensen or Louise doing anything similar because they know how to play in the middle of a back three and good defenders can do that. As you can see, he gets sucked in and by then, he's given the space for the one-two. This shows it perfectly. Attracted to the ball, not following his man, he should be following his man. That would have given him enough time to slow down the run of Callum Wilson. And that would have given more time for Rudiger or Aspilicueta to potentially get back. Now in this clip, Hazard is able to actually receive the ball between the lines. Now, of course, Hazard is our main danger man. And throughout this game, Bournemouth have been using one of their defenders to step up from the defensive line to close him down. And by that time, that gives enough time for one of the midfield players in Gosling or Cook to come and offer defensive support. As we can see here, Cook gets close. Gosling comes and wins it. And again, aggressive pressing, Jordan Ibe comes, no, Stanislas comes back to help receive it. And this is why Hazard struggled so much yesterday. Now I'm gonna be breaking down how we conceded the second goal now. As we can see here, a ball that's been hit out down to the right hand side. A run's been made in from behind. Bournemouth really utilized the pace of their front three exceptionally well in this game. Holds off Cahill, Cahill's sucked in, still ball watching. Now this really annoys me right here. Now I make this criticism about Bakayoko all the time and I was saying it before we even signed him because you know I actually watch the guy play. I watched Monaco play a ton and I made this one point that Bakayoko doesn't see anything happening in from behind him. He just doesn't see it. As you can see in this image here, look at that massive gap and hole. Now Bakayoko should be seeing, you know what, oh wow, Kale's out of position. I need to drop deeper and move in line with Rudiger to stop any one-twos or allow for any of the Bournemouth guys to make runs in behind. Instead, he's just ball watching and he does that way too often. And the reason why Bakayoko does do this is because he's only a ball winning midfielder. He's a guy that would prefer to win the ball higher up the pitch. Now, before I analyze the third goal, I wanted to show this clip of N'Golo Kante and Cesc Fabregas. Now, you guys, I actually honestly feel Cesc Fabregas is key to the system in terms of how he manipulates the ball and how he helps start attacks from deep. He's the best we have at that, especially when there's no David Luiz in the team to do that. It's vital that we have some type of creativity from midfield. And this clip really sums it up. Kante receives the ball, skips past someone. Now look here. Already we can see that Fabregas is calling for the pass and there's a reason why he's doing that because Fabregas makes everything quicker because he analyzes things at a world-class level. This is why his vision is so great. Now here, Kante should have actually played the pass straight away to Fabregas. The clip continues, he's still carrying it. Fabregas is calling for it now. Now why was Fabregas calling for it? Look at the positioning of Eden Hazard. Hazard, as I'm always stressing, makes so many intelligent runs where he does make runs through the gaps with opposition teams. Now, if Kante had played it earlier, Fabregas would have played a direct pass to Eden Hazard, who had the potential to go one-on-one. -on -one. And let's say he did that, that could have been one-one, and then it's a completely different game. And this is why I always prefer Kante actually to just be sitting deeper, because when he does play in the opposition half, He's just too slow on the ball when it comes to making those decisive passes. He just doesn't see it. I didn't think that Conte should have taken off Barkley in this game because, again, look at the position Fabregas is in. When he came on, he kept getting in those positions where he was between the lines. Now, Bakayoko was offering absolutely nothing. And I honestly think with the second goal we conceded in particular, if Kante was playing there, there's no way that he wouldn't have been in position. Again, Conte being too negative and not really going for it because there's benefits of being proactive. By the time the pass is made, that hole's gone. Hazard can't make a run anymore. Kante overhits the pass and it's going to the right hand side. And that's just a difference in terms of if you don't play things quickly, the type of attacking opportunities you miss. And with this team in particular, especially when Fabregas isn't playing, the amount of times that Hazard gets in those positions 
always goes to nil because no one ever finds him. Here's another clip of how Fabgas really helps our play in the final third. Again, look at the position he's taken up between the lines again, being that passing outlet. And because he's always offering support whenever he's on the ball, that really helps our wing backs get forwards. As we can see here, looks to receive it, plays the pass, and we can sustain the ball in the final third better. Now, I'm going to be breaking down the third goal. And again, a lot of you guys will remember I make this point. I've always felt that we're not very good at defending for set pieces. Now, as we can see here in this clip immediately, the first thing I'm thinking of, who the hell is picking up Aki and Cook? Rudiger, Alonso and Kale slow to react, didn't pick up their man, they're panicking, and here's where the first mistake comes. Yep, none of them are like getting the ball, and that's left Cook unmarked. Now, imagine if he had scored from that, but even after that, again, these guys would be quick to really push out and press and really stop any more opportunities coming in. It's, just, it's such a simple rule. The top class players, they should know that. It really just summed up how slow they were when it came to reacting to anything. And yep, Aki gets the third deservedly. And I thought Aki was absolutely fantastic in this game. And I make this point that, you know, these guys are good enough. If we had kept him, we didn't have to waste money on other players who aren't necessarily better than them. And we could have used that money on buying top class or world class players. Again here, another clip. Look, all of them in no man's land. No one's picking up their man. He gets the early run in front of Cahill, who is probably his poorest performance by far so far this season. Just really poor stuff. Just two more points to make. I thought I'd leave this clip in because I really think that really sums up everything we are when it comes to playing under a Conte system. Pass made to Aspie. Now, no options anywhere around him because it's all about playing direct balls into the middle. And it's just ridiculous. And it just, this is how Conte likes to play because he doesn't care about if possession's lost. It's all about if the defensive structure is tight. That's the main thing. And honestly, I just don't agree with that from a philosophical point. As we see here, no option by Aspie loses the ball unnecessarily. And for a big team, we lose possession of the ball way too easily in the final third. It's not good enough. Now, one of the only positives in this game was Callum Hudson-Odoi. When he came on, he was just doing things that Barkley and Pedro weren't doing throughout the entire game. He's 17. If you were to look at it from an objective point of view, why couldn't he start more games? Why can't he play more? It's obvious that he's ready. Came in straight on from the sub bench. Only his second ever appearance for Chelsea and he did bits. This is how I like us to play. As we see here, Callum's received the ball on the left hand side. And this is what I like. And this is what I've, this is the area where I've missed Eden Hazard playing. He's on the left hand side collecting the ball, running at people because when you run at people, you're dragging opposition players out and then you're freeing up space on the flanks. That's how we should be playing. It's not that hard. Hudson's cutting inside. Great piece of score to skip past someone. Plays the pass. That frees up space for Alonso. And honestly, this would have been a world-class goal. So unlucky. And yeah, our best piece of play comes right at the end. But anyway, you guys, I hope you enjoyed the tactical breakdown video I've done. I'm going to get better at these. I still haven't thought of a format on how to really incorporate me speaking and obviously bringing our points but bear with me over the next month hopefully i'll find a perfect format for it i hope you guys enjoyed the video and i hope some of you guys saw the perspective from which i see things anytime i analyze chelsea and look at our problems but anyway you guys thank you for watching i'm the fc this is blue line cv signing out